encourage right. people oh. to put comments in the um, in the comment box. Keep All right, Deemer, we are live here. All right. Let's see. Uh, welcome, everyone, to our first FCL cast. We've got a big Duke Syracuse game up in the dome. I'm joined by Stephen, Race Stephen Rafis, newest member of the first class lacrosse team. Stephen, excited to be here with you. Yeah, I'm pumped. It, it should be a great game uh, between these two teams. I feel like it always is. Um, I think we both had our fair share um, of good battles just on either side. Um, really looking forward to it. Um, quick shout out to uh, Dan Nathan at Risk Reversal Media for letting us use his studio today. Um, awesome setup. So really looking forward to getting this game rolling. Yeah, huge thanks to Dan and uh, excited to talk shop. There's been so many classic Duke Cuse games over the years. I think Steven and I were looking at the last 10 years and there was at least eight one goal games four overtime games four one goal games and uh we were fortunate to be a part of a lot of those so excited for another thriller and uh midweek not many other games going on tonight yeah prime time um i know a couple of years back they were doing that uh thursday night acc lacrosse um, they've switched right now to Wednesday. I'm not sure if coming up this season, if there's going to be any other ones, but a good showing for both teams. Um, I think uh, across the country, all eyes are going to be on both these teams. They're both ranked between top five. I think Cuse is six in some polls. Um, so last season, Duke was 2-0 and against Syracuse. They played twice. Um, so I think Cuse is looking for some revenge and I, and I think Cuse is looking to, um, kind of get back in that conversation as, as one of the top teams. I think Duke has clearly been, um, one of the top teams, not only in the ACC, but in the country last year, falling to Notre Dame in the national championship game. So definitely a good test for, for this Syracuse team. Yeah. And I don't think there's been too many games that Duke has really been tested. You know, they've, you know, they were challenged by Richmond last week, but I think the defense, and Patrick Jameson in the net played really well. And uh, obviously they had one loss to Penn. So I think Cuse is going to prove to be a great test, especially on the road. Uh, we were looking at the numbers. I think Duke is one and five on the road against Syracuse, one and four in the dome. So I think that's going to be a challenge in and of itself. I can remember back to 2015, we got blown out in the dome and we just heard this heavy metal like noise after every play and people just screaming and i think uh it caught us by surprise a bit yeah definitely um i'm interested to see i think patrick jameson off to a great start um i feel like it's usually pretty highlighted when a when a freshman goalie gets his his first start in the dome i know it's not his first start for duke um ever but it's it'll be his first time playing in the dome and i think just with the with the different lighting playing indoors um i think syracuse is going to obviously look to test him early but he's been up for the task uh with any with any team this year and and one thing i did want to ask you just like what what are some things that you're looking for um previewing this game um that you want to keep an eye on yeah i think one thing that i think is big is the middle of the field play you know tyler carpenter coming off the wings uh, short sticks, Jack Gray, Caputo, and of course, Aiden McGuire, um, how they work on the wings with Jake Naso coming off the first team all America season, but how they create early offense. I think that's going to be big. Um, I think obviously in the box, you know, both teams are going to battle, but being able to get those early offense goals and those juice goals are going to be huge. So I'm looking for that early at a Duke. Um, I'm looking for Andrew McAdory firing out of the box. He's been, I think first team all America caliber coming out of the midfield back to his natural position. Um, and I'm looking at the Kenny Brower and Spelina matchup. Uh, they battled last year. Um, I'm looking for the Duke short sticks um, to match up against guys like Luke Roa in the midfield. So I think there's a lot of great matchups and games within the game uh, tonight for, for Duke and Q's. Yeah, definitely. I think first thing you spoke about was the middle of the field. I think when you get an ACC play, um, that's usually the the biggest um, 
component of the game that can kind of shift it in either way. I think I was taking a look um, at both teams' ground ball stats, and both teams um, have been winning the ground ball battle against their opponents um, in total on the season. Um, of note, Syracuse and their two losses in their overtime loss to Maryland and their overtime loss to Army, um, they did lose the ground ball battle by one or two. But one or two is really all you need in an overtime game like that. So that's something to keep an eye on here. I think face-off wise, Syracuse, they've struggled the past couple of years at the X, uh, most notably last year. But um, having Mason Cohn and Johnny Mullen, I think these two have been um, doing a great job this season. And I think they're at 64% right now. So really interested to see um, the possession battle. I think that if Duke can kind of maintain possession like they did last year in both of these games, I think that's obviously a plus for Duke um, and just getting those guys touches. I think Syracuse, their offense was on fire last year um, across the board. And I think it is again this year, but you're seeing it kind of result in more wins right now. Um, I believe they're seven and two just with getting those more possessions and, and keeping the ball out of, out of the opponent's stick. Yeah. And I think building off that, you know, we talked about the middle of the field and the possession battle, uh, the way that Duke cleared the ball against Penn resulted in a lot of opportunities early for the Penn offense. And those are the kind of goals that going into the dome, if you're giving Syracuse those easy ones from not being able to convert on some clears, I think that's something to to just watch out for. Um, not, I don't think there's anything I've seen from a ride perspective that Cuse has done out of the ordinary um, that has, you know, makes it a storyline but if they're able to cause a couple turnovers there and get those easy goals i think that's the kind of momentum that uh you know teams um you know from years past for syracuse really thrive on yeah definitely um curious to see that right i think it was tough when one watching that u penn duke game on tv sometimes with um the way that the camera's angled it's tough to see if they are 10 manning and i think when i was watching that i was kind of wondering what's going on um interested to see if, if syracuse takes note there i haven't seen um any team kind of 10 man duke since then but and Cuse really isn't known to, to throw much of a 10 man in there so that could be something to watch and, and if they pick that up from the penn game yeah, and from a from a Duke ride perspective, it's typically always been the the more standard drop back, three three ride, you know, get back in the hole, play in the box defense, and you know, again, like we talked about, I, I'm excited to see these Duke short sticks. I think they're some of the most athletic in the country, but I also think, like we talked about, guys like Luke Roa and Michael Leo, you know, have really come on as party starting type midfielders so i think that's going to be a great battle there yeah definitely and so we got the game starting here first thing i'm noticing interesting syracuse is wearing their orange uniforms with the uh blue helmet and blue shorts that's the first time i've seen that combo from them in the dome so we'll, we'll see what's what's the typical go-to typical just all white or blue shorts white top usually always a white top i, th I think they did all orange um one season one game one season sorry all right, so we see Max Sloat coming out of the box. Mac Dory's typically the third one on. Let's see who's the last one coming out. We've got freshman Ben Johnson. So Sloat is a redshirt freshman. Johnson, big-time player out of Illinois, and Avon Old Farms. Big save there. Nice job creating in the middle of the field. Zawada runs it out. So he's going to be one to watch. He's really come on strong, definitely playing beyond his years as a freshman midfielder. Matt Cadori, like we said, back to his original position. And Steven, you've been really wanting to watch this Alexa matchup because they matched up behind goal line last year. Yeah, last year with Matt Cadori, um at attack and Sam Alexo playing down low, they have both shifted to the midfield. So Sam is back to his original position of LSM. Great save there. And Matt Cadori is back to midfield. So looking for that matchup there. Uh, two great saves. I think Mark caught that first one off his foot. Um, he had he's had a great season last year, but struggled a little bit against Duke in that second game. So great start for him there. Yeah, that's big. We talked about that before. It looked like in the second game last year at Duke, which we were at as alums, which was exciting. Um, I think he was only 35%. So for him to get too early, that's always big for the confidence. And obviously the Duke guys got to continue to fire they were, you know, both solid takes, but, you know, sometimes stick side high is dead center. It's, you know, it's one that he can build confidence off of. Yeah, definitely. And looking at the Syracuse offense here, obviously a ton of stars on either side of the field. Um, Got to highlight Joey Spillina uh, and that Kenny Brower matchup. Um, take there by Leo. 
good save out the other way. But with that Kenny Brower splitting the matchup, uh, Brower kind of got the best of him in that first game in the Dome last year. But I think Joey had five points in that second game at Duke. So um, looking looking forward to seeing them play. Are you surprised with Carpenter on Leo on that on that first line? Yes, it's interesting. I think taking a look at the Syracuse midfield, and I feel like it, they don't really have a first line and second line talent wise. I feel like it's one A and one B. Um, I think you could throw either line out there, and and they've got some really good top six guys. Um, interested to see what they do with Mule. A lot of a lot of teams have been short sticking him at attack. Um, I'm not surprised with the Leo poll. I think he's kind of proven, especially in that Maryland game. If you don't put a poll on him. Um, he's going to find success. So interested to see, though, what they do with Sam English. Um, interested to see what they do with Jake Stevens. So definitely definitely a storyline to watch there. So a couple couple weeks ago, uh, we highlighted Josh Zawada and Dyson Williams for the Duke offense. These guys played together three years. There's another save. save. Uh, three years together at the Hill Academy. Um, Josh is back for his fifth year, transferred from Michigan. Um, after graduating he's from Raleigh, North Carolina, they've had an awesome connection this year for over 13 or 14 goals um, together. So that's going to be a duo that we want to keep eyes on throughout. Yeah, Josh Swada coming full circle. He was uh, committed to Syracuse until I think October and November of his senior year of, of high school. Year. Yeah. And then switched to Michigan. Now he's at Duke for his grad year uh, playing in the Dome for the first time. Did you ever get any scoop on that one? No, I didn't. He he came on his official, and then he decommitted shortly after. I think he was a big Syracuse fan at the time, but I think something worked itself out with with Michigan and what he was looking for. So they have they are short sticking Mule. Um, good luck there. Nice save on the doorstep. Nice save. It does seem like you know again two quick possessions for Cuse, but the look that they got prior to that one, like they're zipping the ball around. That's something that you and I have talked about a lot. They swing the ball really well. Guys like Hiltz, they don't over carry too much, you know, and the ball zips wing to wing. So that'll be something that I'm excited to see how Duke covers that and how, you know, the Puce guys continue to, to sling it. Yeah. And I think that's just an interesting thing to note. Um, beginning of games. There we go. We got a goal there by Duke. Um, beginning of games wise, from an offensive standpoint, and this is both going for Duke and Syracuse, I think they both took some early shots, but they were, they were all good looks. Um, and it's kind of finding that balance of figuring out if you want to go early, if you want to see what the defense is doing. I think one of the best ways, obviously, to see what the defense is doing is to attack them early. Um, I think people can be like, don't hesitate to take that first shot because you don't want to get the goalie too hot. Um, but I think all the looks that they've all been taking on both sides of the ball, both Duke and Syracuse have been good. Well, and to your point about you know judging those shots that's a huge response from johnston we just talked about you know 10 12 yards dead center stick side high comes back against the pole sweeps middle off hip placement um he came to our best in class committed event uh two years ago one awesome kid works his ass off and two um, you know, obviously is extremely skilled and being able to change up your placement like that on the run is big time. Yeah, that was awesome. And noting there, Duke has won the first two faceoffs. Um, Carpenter just picked up that last ball. Just want to want to give him a shout out. I feel like he's been at Duke for forever at this point. Um, he's just a menace in the middle of the field. He picks up every ground ball. He's got great stick skills. So we got the uh, pull on McAdory again. Must be a whistle there. We were almost uh, on point with our Zawada Dyson connection. I think Dyson would have liked to have that one back. I think he had six or seven last year at the at the Duke home game, and there was at least three or four more that you would have think he should have scored that. Yeah. Um. So he's he's capable of having a big day. So um, excited to see that. Uh, appreciate all of our viewers who are in. Uh, continue to. Drop in thoughts, questions in the comments. I really appreciate you all uh, joining us for the game tonight. Uh, Steven and I are going to continue to give our analysis, break down the game, share some stories. Uh, Steven graduated from Cuse in 2021. I'm a, a bit more of a savvier vet graduating in 2016, um, but, uh, but excited to be on here with you guys. Yeah, awesome start here. Um, taking a look at the comments, shout out to Brian Cavanaugh. He, he also commented on the color combo. 
for our uniforms tonight. <laughs> Brian Cav is always always ready for some hot takes on uh on Twitter. So if you don't follow him, make sure you uh make oh, yeah. sure you go give him a request all the time. But see, I think I think one thing from watching Duke film, and we just saw it there again, um, just how athletic their offensive players are. I think, obviously, I don't think a bunch of teams want to be sliding off of these guys, but they do create those matchup um, nightmares in terms of a guy like McAdory. Um, when he's dodging, he's almost always drawing at least one or two, and then that can free up guys like Zawada. I feel like when you're watching Zawada, um, he has a pull on him as, as much as possible, but he has been getting some good matchups against short sticks um, on the backside or at X just from that movement from up top. Yeah, that one goes Cuse's way there. Uh, looked like the long stick was on Balsamo, uh, senior Aiden Denenza out of St. Anthony's, and then Jack Papendick, a, uh, a Boston um, area native um, on that midfield line. And uh, with Balsamo, you know, drawing the pole, guys like Denenza, who's been stepping up more, you know, his senior year, are just going to be key against the Q short sticks. And then how does how does O'Neill start to get involved uh, as well as Zawada and Dyson? Yeah, so here we got that other line. We have Jake Stevens, Luke Roa. Um, I believe Jackson Burt Whistle is out there on the crease. Yeah, so we're still short sticking Mule, I think, on both for both of those midfield lines. Um, Jake Stevens always demands a poll. Um, interesting that they're polling Burt Whistle over uh, Luke Roa. But... I mean, I, I think they're both big scoring threats. I think Luke Rowe had that great game against Maryland um, where he was kind of just attacking those shorties um, and winning his matchup. And I think he did it again a little bit against Army. So maybe look for them to exploit that. He was really calling for the ball there. Yeah, there's a tough one, uh, tough one on the clear like we talked about in the pregame. So these, I, I always feel like when I was in school, anytime we failed to clear was an automatic goal the other way. Just It's just how it felt and it was always so frustrating yeah i mean uh defensively like if you you go through what 40 60 second possession um you make a stop and then you just kind of have bad stick work on the clear your guys are exhausted oh we've got a penalty there that's a bad call i don't know this would be our first look at the uh is that a 30 second interference i would think so because no possession I don't know. We'll see. But we'll get our first look at the uh, Syracuse man up past two seasons. Um, they've been on fire. They've been switching personnel around a little bit this year. I think mainly injury related, um, but they move the ball very well here. So this will be a fun one to watch. Yeah, I guess it's going to be a 30 second interference there. Illegal body check one minute. Ooh. I guess because it was from behind. That wouldn't be my first call. I don't know. It was a nice ground ball too. You know, again, another save by Jameson. Um, I think shot selection is going to continue to be key. You, you've noticed on both sides, a couple alley shots, um, just lower angle. I think both goalies are too good for some of that. So yeah, it'll just continue to be interesting. So Cuse into that one four one. You see that action so much on extra man offenses. You know, the the two three one into the one four one. You know, double cut. Love Burt Whistle going around the world there. <laughs> he registered his first assist. Uh, I know, first against, career. Was that against Hopkins? Uh, I believe so. The little uh, one more pass? Yeah, it was on man up. Oh, good stick. Wow. Did he tip that? or did that Yeah, just it was tipped. In? Just one of those. Good handle by Finn. Yeah. Thompson, I love Thompson's game. I think he's so smooth. I remember, was it maybe last year or the year before when he was kind of nailing the flyby that you used to love? Yeah. With with uh lefty, right? Yeah. I uh, love that flyby. He was doing it this season with uh Michael Leo as well. Yeah, they've been trying that out. Yeah. That's a good release. That's a that's a tough one for Duke. I think that's a possession all around that they would have liked to have back. Yeah, that's a tough break. That's a good break there for uh for Syracuse for sure. I think starting out there, I think kind of what we expected, both both offenses looking pretty strong. I think the defenses are settling in. I think biggest storyline goalie play. They, I think they each have yep. between two and four saves. Um, so something to watch. Did you get those uh, those live stats. Yeah, let's see. Let's see what 
Dan Aburn at Inside Lacrosse has cooking on the live stats. All right, so just recapping here, we are 1-1 in the first quarter right now. Um, Finn Thompson just with the latest goal on the Syracuse man up with uh, they're crediting Jake Stevens with that assist. Um, that's a lucky one for the box score. They, they might go back and, and check that one out. Um, Duke wise, Ben Johnston, um, on a nice ISO dodge, um, great shot placement. So we are one, one, I think we're five or six minutes into the quarter. Um, like I was saying earlier, face off wise, Duke won the first two. Yeah, it'd be interesting. interesting. It'll be interesting to watch if, um, they've been subbing cone and Mullen or, or they've been interchanging them more frequently ever since I think. The Hopkins game, maybe a game or so before it, um, not because Mason Cohn wasn't doing well, just because I think it's a great to have that one-two punch. Um, and like like we were saying earlier, I think they are at sixty-four percent on the season. Yeah, I, I think always having you know fresh legs or being able to you know steal a couple and, and swap a guy in, um, and, and also it just creates different looks for a face-off guy. Not not nearly my expertise, but um, you you've seen some guys use you know two man systems well to just be able to try to negate and, and tie up a guy like a NASO who's, you know, been the last two seasons been extremely strong, you know, except for ob obviously, you know, championship game last year, Lynch gave him some trouble, but, um, he, he's been one that's really, um, made his mark on, uh, you know, being one of Duke's historic face off men. Yeah, definitely. So we're getting a flashback here. This is last year's game against, um, Against Duke in the Dome, this was overtime winner Charles Balsamo. Would love to talk further about him later. Um, that was a great game. I think Syracuse got off to a hot start there. They were looking, like I was commenting on earlier, they were looking for that big statement win. Um, un unfortunately, they they just couldn't get it, and they couldn't close the deal on the game. Um, so I think that game's definitely in the back of their heads as, as well as the second one. Yeah, that was big for you know, Balsamo, you know, again, especially as a freshman too, just the confidence to take that shot offhanded, you know, a low angle and, uh, and, and get Duke's first ever win in the dome. So, yeah. Um, we got Mullen out there, Johnny Mullen, the freshman Fogo out there for Syracuse. So Duke's now won the first three matchup here, Brendan O'Neill, Billy Juan gets this matchup. Um, biggest thing I'm looking out for with this matchup and with Brennan is, is what we just saw there. I think if he gets going, um, on those transition or early offensive looks, watch out. Huge. No goal flag. Looks like there was Ooh. a flag, a flag that, that was, was a stress. push. That maybe was stressful. A, maybe a loose ball. Huge save right here. I don't, I don't see that one. You get lucky that that second one gets called back, but it's not not too much luck with the Q's extra man unit. Yeah, and I think, right, they called that goal back because Muley, I believe that was Muley, he ended up in the crease off of the Duke hit. Right. Um, so then the ball has to be dead there. Yeah, and you see, too, Mark making the save, big outlet pass, starts the break right away. Duke defense down at close is not marked up and not ready, so it just creates that doorstep opportunity. So, you know, again, like, O'Neal pushing an early offense, he's got to be aggressive. But when you leave it high to high, too, you know, that just creates easy outlets. Yeah. I think it was going over the goal, even. We got Finn running the point up here. I think biggest guy to watch for Syracuse on men up Another is a huge save. Yeah. Wow. Good they save. do a great job because they have the Canadian presence of the wind up to BTB. Yeah. Probably my favorite pass in lacrosse. Yeah. Very smooth and also just it's so deceptive for for those defenders trying to figure out what to do. And I think that's why Syracuse they they would be great in zone as well if if a team decided to zone them. Um, and I do think why they've been so successful um, on the man up. Let's bring it back to Billy Dwan too, Loyola Blakefield graduate. Uh, spent a couple of years under Coach Dunn. Uh, Coach Matt Dunn, our defensive director, is now uh, coaching at Highland Park with Coach Pressler. And there's McAdory off the initiation. Yeah, I'm surprised they're not having McAdory come out third like he has been most of the season. Um, I believe he came out second there, and it just kind of delays delays their process of initiating that offense. Although he did get a great job, dodge off of it. 
There's a nice take by Sloat sweeping off the top. I think especially for these middies too, and the guys that are getting the short sticks, like they have to show that they're willing to go to cage early yeah, and, and create, and that'll hopefully open up some of their star power later in the game. Yeah, and that's actually when I was talking about Brendan O'Neill and, and when he can go early in the offense. Um, I think if if I'm Duke, I love to see Brendan taking that. I know that that shot was saved and it was it resulted in a goal. Um, but the more that he can do that, and, it, and if he's on, obviously the attention's already on him. He's the former tour and winner. But if he can continue um, just to get all that attention on him, I do think it can free up some other guys as well. You can see even out of the substitution game, like there's still there's still openings, there's still opportunities to push and how these teams balance the pace uh, with testing and getting some of those early offense looks is is just going to be key as well, just if they can steal a few. Yeah, I thought that uh, Finn was going to hit Leo there, but great goal by Leo. He got that short stick matchup. I don't know if Duke planned to not switch. I, I saw they kept the pull on Mule there. Um, they found... Michael Leo with the short stick, like I was alluding to earlier, he's really been taking advantage of that this year. Um, and they found him right away. And, and he's very good at this like low angle. He's former attack when he played at St. An Anthony's. Um, he could definitely play attack if, if it weren't for Hiltz. So great take there by him. Yeah, he does a great job being physical there. You can see McGuire trying to throw the two-handed wrap, makes the contact, steps away, creates some space, and then just rolling back topside, having the awareness where he's only two yards above goal line. I'm sure that's one that, uh, you know, McGuire would like back. But I also think that's a battle between those guys where see how it plays out over the course of a game. You know, it's easy to get one one unassisted goal, maybe two. You know, how do you, do you get three? Do you get four? You know, but that's, yeah. that might be all they need out of a, a guy like Leo. Yeah, and I like Leo's style there. He's – he um really does a good job of changing his speed and not necessarily looking like he's going to dodge a hundred miles an hour to the goal. Because I think if you look at the Duke off ball defenders there, they couldn't decide if they wanted to stay or if they wanted to slide to him. Yep. Um, so he did a good job there. of holding. Huge loose ball off the face off there. It's good scrap by Zawada in the corner. Another Duke face off win. And the matchup here with Zawada, they did just get a switch, but you'll see, I believe, um, Figueres on him. He's wearing um, Syracuse number 11. He was, last year he redshirted his, his freshman year, he was injured, um, but he was the highest ranked defensive um, recruit in, in his class. So he's he's been off to a good start this year. Moving pick. Yeah, tough moving pick, pick call. Tried to come around, set the swing pick, didn't give enough room to be able to, you know, get set and, you know, just kind of makes contact while he's moving. And again, these are just kind of some of the early possessions that, you know, both teams are obviously settling in, but it's just giving Q's a lot of momentum. Yeah. Nice pickup there by Hiltz. That brings us to 3 1 Syracuse. That was a bit of a broken, broken clear. Um, Jake Stevens, I couldn't tell if that was another knockdown pass or not, uh, but great handle by Hiltz. Obviously, very slick Canadian, super talented. Yeah, that was back checked there, I think. Stevens was back checked, altered that pass. We'll see if they give him the assist there. <laughs> <laughs> nice home turf bounce. Hiltz is one that I've, I've really enjoyed watching over the years. I actually remember back in... 2018, I was coaching at uh, at McDonough uh, Boys, and we played Culver Academy uh, under John Posner at the time. And uh, Hiltz was a senior and was electric, you know, as a lefty scorer and facilitator. And um, he's obviously gone the cues and had a great career. Yeah, he's so smooth. And I think the best part about his game, aside from stick skills, his shot, is really his IQ. Um, he sees the game well beyond his years and, and he did his freshman year at Syracuse and has only continued to get better. Another early take there by O'Neill. Um, and you see this graphic on the bottom, Duke five faceoffs wins, um, to Syracuse is zero, but three, one Syracuse, uh, with two minutes left, two forty six left in the first. The good news is that they're winning the faceoffs, So they're only down two. 
you know, starting got to start to settle in. The bad news would be if they don't continue that, um, it just starts to put more and more pressure on each possession. So, you know, they just need to settle in here. You know, probably not a look that that yeah. you need to be taken so early in the in the possession there. Yeah, that's one where we were talking about earlier, just like kind of finding that touch and go. What do you want to do early in the game? They're they're settled in enough here with two minutes left at that two minute mark in the first quarter, where I think he could have felt out that invert dodge and then probably just bounced out, moved it. Um, I would like to see Zawada kind of initiating more or having the ball more in his stick here um, early on for Duke. Yeah, and it's interesting from an offensive perspective. Um, so, Stephen, your first year offensive coordinator at Don Bosco in New Jersey this spring with uh, another Cuse alum, uh, Matt Lane at the helm. Uh, you know, what do you think like early on is going to be something that you're going to be trying to teach to guys when it comes to just shot selection or scheme, you know, especially as you've been watching so much college lacrosse? Yeah, definitely. I think in terms of shot selection, especially um, there's no shot clock at the high school level. So right. I think finding that balance of you don't want to be too careful where you're really timid and you're, and you're not putting it all out there. Um, but there are definitely shots where it, it's not worth it taking. I think one thing that we've been really focusing on and we've done a lot with FCL um, film wise is stick to the middle middle. Um, so whether it's those alley dodges, getting that stick back to the middle. So if I'm dodging down the right alley um, by the end of my dodge, moving it back to my left hand and, and finishing. So those are those higher percentage looks. Um, and I think with no shot clock, you really can get those high percentage looks. So um, that's definitely something that we'll be focusing on. Yeah, no, I love that. And I, and I think to your point, like not playing timid, I always, you know, appreciated that against, you know, playing cues was I felt like guys always seemed to play super loose, took chances, took risks. Um, and they're obviously, you know, playing that same way and same style in the first quarter tonight. Yeah. And I think that's something interesting. Um, before I went to Syracuse, obviously when you watch them, there's a lot of creative plays, right? You'll, you've got guys like Owen Hiltz, um, who's thrown behind the back passes. You saw Jackson Burt whistle there taking early around the world. Um, and I was always curious. I was like, if I'm, once I'm at practice, like, are they going to be promoting these things? Like what's kind of going to be the, the way that they go about it? Um, some more, some more just like loose balls there. But I think just back to my point, um, they're not necessarily promoting it, but I think they encourage you to play your own brand. Um, and they're, they're not going to correct you on a mistake. Like if you take it around the world and it, and it hits the pipe or it just misses, they're not going to be like, why'd you do that? Um, they're really going to let you feel it out, which I really appreciated as a player. Yeah. And, and side note, uh, Matt and I wrote about this in our weekly newsletter. Um, you know, if you're not subscribed, um, just head to our website and, uh, you know, we, we send it out every Friday, but last week, Matt and I were down in Orlando and, uh, we were on spring break training. I was working with the Deerfield girls, Matt coaches at Highland park, and we got to spend time with, uh, coach Desco who was working down there. Um, as well as coach Pressler, obviously with his team, um, with Matt. And uh, it was just really cool to hear like two legends of the game. I, I couldn't believe that Coach Desco was at Q's for over 40 years Yeah, as a coach, you know, after being a player. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously really cool to see, you know, the the history, you know, that is Q's lacrosse um, and just, you know, removing yourself from the rivalries and then being able to hear more about uh, the game and how the games evolved and, you know, old strategies and the armadillo play. Like it was, it was pretty awesome last week. Yeah, definitely. I think John Desco is Syracuse lacrosse through and through um, from being, I believe he was an assistant. I want to say for like 18 or so years. Um, he's got many, many national championships. I know, I believe he has five as a head coach. Wow. Um, and he, he's got a very unique and interesting way about him. Um, he's a, he's a great guy, great person. Um, I think he really picks and chooses his spots for, for when to interject and when to correct people. Um, I really appreciated just the way that he went about, um, his business, just in terms of letting his players play and letting them figure things out for themselves. Right. Cause once you get to college and you're at that age and, um, it just, it helps you in your maturation process as well. Yeah. So nice graphic on the screen about the goalie play so far you know, high level from both guys, um, you know, definitely a couple more on the doorstep from, uh, from Cuse, um, you know, offensively and a couple broken plays. Uh, but, uh, again, I still impressed with the saves that Jameson's made early on and, 
I think if Duke can clean up some of the middle of the field and, and some miscues, I think it'll be an exciting second quarter. Yeah, definitely. And um, look at Patrick Jameson. He's, he's definitely settled in well um, here. Like I was alluding to earlier at the, at the start, when we started this um, freshman boys, when, when they enter the dome, just being indoors first time in there, first time seeing kind of the different lighting and the backdrop of the bleachers um, it can throw some guys off, but, but he looks very comfortable in there. Indoor lighting is one of the more difficult things I think to get right with indoor facilities. You know, you don't see it too much. Um, you know, I think Notre Dame early on, like they have some indoor games, mm -hmm. you know, in their football facility. I'm trying to even think of what other programs. I think Bryant just put in a new one. Yeah, you'll see BC, BC women sometimes will play. I don't know if that's a bubble or if that's that indoor football facility. Another early take there by O'Neill um, to start the quarter. Once again, I like that he's being aggressive, but I think he's tested the waters out on that, and I think they could really use a nice, solid 6v6 possession where they could um, get a goal out of it. But at the same time, like if that's a goal, that that can change momentum as well. It's, it's a fine balance because I remember watching, I think it was the Penn game, and you know, there was maybe one or two shots where you know I'm, I'm thinking like, hey, maybe Brennan could have moved that or not taken it. And then you see some of the ones that he does stick from 15 and it blows your mind, mm -hmm. you know, or some of the ones he sticks in the corner. And I think honestly, at the end of the day, like he just needs eight, eight plus shots a game. Yeah. You know, he just needs to put pressure on the D because those are going to fall. Um, I would love with his size if he put him on his back and, you know, takes one more step in front. But, you know, I think Brennan's such a humble guy that, you know, Hey, they want him firing. You yeah. know, and he's going to, and over time, over the course of four quarters, he's going to have the right takes and the right looks. And I think here, if McAdory here, if we can get him going, I think that's going to be huge too. Yeah. They, so now they got McAdory. He came out third there. Um, Syracuse didn't exactly look ready for it as, as they had a short stick on him to start. Um, thought they would capitalize off that. To your point, I'm surprised that that wasn't first possession, you know, having him run out of the box, but you know, at the same time, like he's going to play so many possessions that maybe they were just throwing something different to get other guys going early. Yeah, exactly. Got a transition opportunity here. So Dyson stepped over. So one of the middies has to stay back to make sure they avoid getting off sides. And then let's see what happens in the substitution game. He'll just mark up, get over the line. Yeah, great play by him there. Um, and also, I, I always feel like when an attackman goes over the midfield in the ride, and the team doesn't go off sides. It's a credit also to those midfielders right. uh, for up. recognizing that. Looks like we got McAdory. Yeah, McAdory on Duke is stuck on defense. I think they're going to look to take advantage of this with Burt Whistle. Uh, I don't, I don't love that take. Um, I think could have just used that matchup some more. Maybe bring McAdory to X, milk some more time. Um, get settled in. I think Syracuse does have a great invert offense. Oof, a lot of tipped passes. You like to see both teams though, taking chances, yeah, you know, it. and I think like that's what makes this Duke Cuse rivalry exciting. A uh, lot of high scoring games over the years. I think the second one at Duke last year was 18, 15. Um, you know, I remember we had a couple in 2015, 2016 that were, you know, OT in the mid teens, even before the shot clock era, you never had to worry about a uh, shot clock violation in a Duke Cuse game. Yeah. Can't say that for every, uh, every program out there. No, definitely not. I think that speaks to kind of the way that these ACC games are also played, um, which make them super exciting to watch. Nice look. That's a great offensive possession there. That, I mean, that's what you've been talking about. Like that's what they needed um the rotation gets moving you got o'neill on a short stick nice to see him distributing as a feeder mm -hmm. and then mcadory with a beautiful hitch yeah and he doesn't even need to do much there um speaking about o'neill with when he has that short stick on him like if he just threatens a little bit like he's going um and that creates that backside just wide open great hitch there too we'll definitely be getting uh our content machine adam lombardi uh, breaking down that hitch Have and to. Uh, and getting that on the FCL socials. Nice offense. Nice look off pass by O'Neal. 
And I like to, you know, just to nerd out on the hitch for a second. I really like how when he sells his wind up, he, he just shows a variation where he doesn't do anything crazy with his hands. Mm -hmm. It's all sold by hands back, very subtle. And then he just steps around the defender. Sometimes that's all you need to sell an effective hitch. Yeah. We'll see the flag down there. They'll be smart if they can play this possession out. Yeah. Mullen had that clamp there, but Naso ended up getting that ground ball. So I still believe that Duke has won every faceoff here. This is a guy I really like, Balsamo. I know you're really high on him. Um, sophomore for Duke. I just think he's really smart. He plays the game at his own pace. Um, and does a lot of the little things, right, that I think really make this Duke offense run. And we'll see Alex Slusher, uh, fifth year out of, or I think he's only a fourth year out of Princeton. He might have, a, he might have an extra year at Duke available. Um, you know, you see him get into the invert game as well as some big little. So let's see how he... He operates here. Looks like Zawada got pushed in the crease, so that's going to kill the possession. Yeah, I wonder if they call a push there or if the ref kind of acts like he didn't didn't notice that. But that's unfortunate then. Unfortunate there for Duke. Excuse me. Now, Stephen, you were talking about how Cuse has a completely separate man down unit. Um, is that something that happened before John O'Dierna? join the staff? No, so that is new. So John O'Dierna is the defensive coordinator at Syracuse. This is his first year there. He was previously the head coach at Manhattan. Um, looking at it now, yes. Yeah, so Syracuse will bring in an entirely new um, defensive man down unit. So all of these guys are backups for normal six on six play. Um, and their entire job is dedicated to playing man down so it's like their biggest main focus um it's a great way to get these guys on the field um and really bought in um i think a lot of people were skeptical about it but it is it is proven to to been to be working um at this point in the season i think duke a little bit sloppy there uh, but i think syracuse has to be happy about that do you think and, and you know do you know much about the methodology is it um those guys are really suited for that man down d or is it kind of a combination of we just want because we have the depth at cues we just want two groups of guys focused on different things yeah i think it's twofold i think it's great for um team culture and, and team chemistry and getting getting those guys um to be really heavily invested and giving them like a job and a role i think depth wise definitely like these guys they've showed that they that they can handle the pressure out there um, when I was saying, I think people were skeptical of it. I think that's because, so if, if you have a 30 second man down, um, and then that possession ends, um, and then Duke is running or any team is running just normal six on six offense. I think people were skeptical then like, okay, well now they have to play true six on six, but I think that speaks to the depth that, um, they have been able to handle, handle, um, the six on six sets. Yeah. I also just, I think of a guy like Billy Dwan and, We've seen Billy play three by, and he might be one of the best three by players out there along with Jay Carlson. Wow. So I'm going to make that bold statement. And uh, that's high it, it just makes me think that Billy also would be phenomenal with his stick on the man down unit. But if you've got that system and you're sticking to it, I, I get that. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like, I'm sure all these, all the cues starters, all, all the defenders could definitely be on man down. Um, I would love to to ask Odierna further, further about that. Um, I know I, I haven't gotten the chance to, I've met him once or twice, but would love to kind of pick his brain. I know he did it at Manhattan and carried it over, um, but definitely something to watch. Yeah. So as we catch up here, three, two Syracuse, uh, just over eight minutes left in the second quarter. Um, you know, I think one of the storylines has been just a handful too many of empty possessions, uh, you know, on the Duke side of things. And not necessarily from a just not scoring, but uh, just some miscues and stuff that I think, you know, they'll look, be really looking to clean up heading into the second half. Um, you know, just, you know, not being able to get as many quality possessions to really test the QC. Yeah, and looking here, so they started that possession out. Um, Leo has that short stick matchup. They are opting. They're putting McGuire on him. Um, and... That could also be, I mean, McGuire's, he's, he's one of the more highly touted D-mids in the country. 
Um, so that could be a pur purposeful matchup. I don't know if they want to get the pole on him or not, um, but we'll keep an eye on that as well. I didn't see who had the second pole because I noticed Mule had a short stick. I know Sam English had a pole. Um, so Finn Thompson must have had a pole as well. Yeah, I think there's there's also a psychological component to that. You know, sometimes if guys are used to getting a pole and then you get the short stick, now you feel like every time you touch the ball, you have to make the play. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that some guys don't do great with that, you know, and and if a guy takes on that mentality and they're not used to giving it up when they should, then it can just cause some different flow within the offense. Yeah, definitely. It's like the it's a defensive chess match, right? So they're they're trying to figure out and and mess with the other team. So if Leo's coming out there every single time or the majority of the time and getting that pole, and then he he walks out there and has a short stick, you know he's going to be calling for the ball and, and trying to go. And you were alluding to it earlier, but he he scored on that first first matchup with um Maguire, but it also it is tough. Just because you have a short stick on you doesn't mean that you're gonna score every time. Yeah, so definitely. You know, would have liked to see one more step there. Um, I was just going to say that the possession was more sustained than it had been. Yeah. You know, working more of the invert with Slusher, seeing some 2-2-2, two, 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 you know, moving the ball across the top. Nice ride there. Wow, what a play by Stevens. Great save on that ride. Jake Stevens and Sam English, they are both um, transfers. They're both midfielders. They both graduated from Princeton. Um, Sam English has two years at Syracuse, and Jake Stevens has one. Um, they haven't been putting up the same numbers offensively that they were at Princeton, but I think what these guys are doing um, in the middle of the field, whether it's playing wings, whether it's getting back and being a true two-way midian and playing defense, I think um, has been really beneficial for Syracuse. Nice so, take. Yeah, there we saw Mule um, working on that short stick matchup. So Mule is um, a Syracuse attackman, and he's been getting more. He's been getting short stick by the other team, and and the reason they've been doing that is Syracuse's midfield is, is very talented, and they've been wanting to bring up a pole there. Um, you see him attack this matchup, and he finds um, Luke Roa, who we were speaking about earlier. He has one of the best shots on the roster, um, both lefty and righty on the run. I think he's a super underrated guy. Um, nice shot there. Yeah, he can pull it. He's got a lot of pop on a shot. And, uh, you know, even there, like Mule didn't win his matchup, uh, but he was able to find enough of a soft spot, delivered the ball on the stick, and then, you know, kind of shot right off the defender's hip. So it looked like Jameson was screened a little bit, stick side high, nice release from Roa. Yeah, and I think that's a good point you make on the Mule dodge that he didn't win his matchup per se right if you're watching that you're not like oh Mule just toasted that short stick um and as an offensive player you really don't have to you just have to be applying the right pressure at times um and manipulate the other five defenders out there right so if you look like you're going to be a threat or if you get to a certain point like maybe if you get inside the hashes um on a football field that can be a a, um, a telling point for defensive players that they need to start showing or need to to look to help um, so I think he's been doing a good job of that all year. You won't usually see him run by anyone, uh, but he's got great IQ and and it's been beneficial for him. I love this uh, love this comment from uh, Jared Newman Jr. Mock draft Brennan O'Neill number one pick to the Outlaws. Uh, big trade news actually in PL last week. Um, Coach Pressler trading away Chris Gray to get the number five pick, I believe. And yeah, I think he had to give up a 18th pick. I saw the trade. I don't know what the picks were. I was pretty surprised by the trade personally, just with how, how good Chris Gray is and how good he's yeah. been for the Atlas. I think there was rumors around that meaning that he's planning to take Schellenberger to then pair up with current Atlas players, Xander Dixon. And then that might leave Gray in a tough spot if they kept him. And then it also probably allows them to get a guy like Ajax. Is Entman coming out this year? He is. Entman will be huge in the league. Yeah, that's that's a sneaky. So move they there. they might be able to have two big time top five picks. So Atlas has the number one pick. Two number two pick. With so the, if O'Neill goes one, sorry, Atlas goes one. You know, and then hey, where does that leave? Is O'Neill a lock for one though? 
I think, I think this is where it just comes down to, to your system and how you want to play. You know, I think that's what people don't always understand and like, you know, about the, you know, the pro leagues too. And it's hard when there's a lot of turnover on the coaching staffs, you know, like what kind of style are you looking to play? I don't love that take. If the outlaws were to take Schellenberger, then O'Neill's obviously the next best option. I would say they're probably the top two guys. You also have Pat Kavanaugh in consideration there. Um, he's coming out this year. So then if you're the Atlas, you have one of the best lefties in the world in T. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure he can play with O'Neill, but, um, that'll be interesting. Interesting to watch. I think, I think you'd want to have a righty ball carrier with Dixon off ball and then have T B and T all over the lefty wing. So you'd probably take Pat Kavanaugh at that point, which would be a great get for them as well. Yeah. So we saw there, I think, kind of two quicker possessions. Um, Duke won another face-off, by the way. So Syrac Eight face -off? Syracuse Eight? has not won a face-off yet. If you told me that with four minutes left in the first, in the second quarter, sorry, that Syracuse has not won a single face-off, I would not believe you if you said that it was 4-2 Syracuse. I will give a, a plug to uh, 2013 Brendan Fowler, who in our championship game against Cuse went 23 for 25 basically made the NCAA change the face-off rules after he dominated. Yeah. That was a tough loss. Syracuse went up early. We were down five, one. And I just remember coach Janowski calls a timeout and tells us to breathe and have fun and enjoy it. And we started just clawing our way back in the game, but it was one of those, Holy shit. Like we're down. 5-1 in the championship. Yeah. There again on that Duke possession, I said it earlier, I would like to see Zawada just get more involved here. Um, Zawada, O'Neal, and Dyson Williams are their top three point scorers, and they have all, well, I guess O'Neal has one assist, but Dyson and Zawada have yet to register a point today. Um, so look for them to really push that that matchup or, or push those two there. Um, we were talking about their connection earlier and I know you did a whole piece on them, but I do think that that could get this Duke offense going. Yeah. I think they've done a nice job of covering up Dyson inside. And then I, I, I really just think out of the midfield, you know, just continuing to improve shot selection and just being a little more patient is going to pay dividends. You know, it's just, you know, again, a couple tweaks, you know, a couple better angles. And I, I think again, like we saw in that Johnston shot early, like testing Mark in different spots, mm -hmm. there has been a lot, you know, to the upper half of the cage that he's been able to gobble up. He's a bigger goalie. And so I just, I just think they got to continue to push for different quality, you know, in terms of the shots, continue to get the middle, like the Nenza just did, but then again, just continue to, to make improvements on the placement. I would like to see Balsamo get going. I would like to see more of that two, three offense ball side pair three man on the backside that Duke has been sporting the last couple of years. I would like to see them get that going more consistently. Mm -hmm. And especially that possession that we were commenting on earlier with the uh, McAdory goal. Um, I think that just showed exactly what we're looking to see. We're just looking to see a little bit more movement um, out of the offense as a whole, drawing that slide and then moving it, right? Finding finding the next open guy and then finding the matchup. Um, a lot of these guys can take advantage of of a mismatch. So if, if they have a short stick, a guy like O'Neal, McAdory, Zawada, um, look to push that. This is nice here, keeping it in the family. Um, Donowski's have obviously been a huge part of Duke's success. Um, the Simmons family. I said earlier how John Desco is Syracuse lacrosse. If there's anyone more Syracuse lacrosse than him, it is the Simmons family. Um, I had the pleasure to play with Ryan Simmons and Roy Simmons, the third, I believe, um, was our director of ops, and he's just one of the one of the best people that I've ever had the had the chance to be around. So nothing but great things to say about their family. Uh, what year was Ryan? Ryan graduated in 2018. He was 18, so he was yes. two years behind me. Yes, he was a fifth year in 18. Got it. Yeah, I was fortunate Matt uh, started on staff when I was a freshman. Okay. So Matt came in, was like working with the attack. Uh, Coach Caputo was running the offense. 
And then uh, Joe Sanoski, actually Maryland grad, was was the volunteer and working with Coach D more on the defensive side. And then I had Coach Caputo on offense for all four years. And then I think it was the year after that's when Coach Caputo switched to the defensive side. And then um, you know Matt has fully taken over the offense. A couple of years, Ned Crotty was volunteer. Um, and then last couple of years, Alex Reddy has been doing a great job working with the goalies last year. Uh, for those who don't know, um, the NCAA put in a new rule where you could have four paid full-time coaches mm -hmm. instead of just three and a volunteer. Uh, so that's been impactful for a lot of men's and women's lacrosse staffs across the country. Yeah, it's great. Right. I mean, I think it, it gets more help, help there. And, and I think it's funny when you look across just how many assistants some some sports have syracuse football made a post today there was Zawada. i do like him getting involved they've been shooting really high on on will mark um i feel like actually a lot of them and i can't tell if it's from the angle that we're seeing it the ball looks like it's been going over will mark big frame it seems like he's actually been saving a lot of balls that are missing um and then pushing them in transition so um obviously that's great for him but Syracuse will call a timeout here with 149 left in the second quarter, up 4-2. Um, we have 64 seconds left on the shot clock, so they're not going to be holding for the last shot, but I do think um, they're going to want to get a nice, solid possession. I think if they could go into halftime um, with a three-goal lead, they would obviously love that. Um, look for guys. I, we haven't called Spelina's name very much. Um, he hasn't necessarily had to do anything. He hasn't, he hasn't been doing anything wrong. Um, uh, but I think a lot of their midfield midfield production has been great. Um, Mule with that short stick, we'll look to see if they invert. Um, and as we were alluding to earlier, I think when the ball goes through Owen Hill's stick on this offense, I think good things happen. When you watched the Hopkins game, um, he was on fire to start that third quarter. And that's really when Syracuse made their run and pulled away from Hopkins. Um, and then last week against Delaware, he tied, I believe a career high with six goals, um, and he's capable of doing that. Um, we were talking about recruiting earlier and just recruiting rankings and whatnot um, on this field right now. Joey Spelino is the number one recruit in the country. Uh, McAdory, I believe, is the number one recruit in the country. Brendan O'Neill, number one recruit in the country. So all different classes. Um, in Brendan O'Neill's class, he was the number one recruit. The number two recruit that season was Owen Hiltz. So just tying that back together there. Um, obviously, not any groundbreaking news, but there is a ton of talent on this field. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we, we, you and I have talked about this before, but, uh, you know, and I've heard from other people as well, you know, Pat March is a fantastic recruiter, um, has been doing a great job over the years, uh, you know, of really scouring for a lot of talent, you know, Cuse has been really strong in their recruiting classes. Uh, you know, Duke, same thing, you know, has pulled a lot of top guys, you know, Ben Johnston, like we just talked about again, top five recruit, uh, Tomas Delgado, another, you know, top recruit who hasn't seen as many minutes tonight, but a uh, lot of top 50 guys, top hundred guys littered all over the field and, uh, really competitive, you know, at both of these programs to, to, uh, get playing time and huge save, big save there. So Mule worked that matchup. Um, you'll see Syracuse do a, a four up top, two behind. They they decided to put Mule up um, with the four there, which is primarily like the midfielders, um, and work that matchup. We'll see if Duke can get one here. I like that take by by Brennan. I like when he's aggressive. I I know it's been a few now, but. I think that's the first time it's really been sweeping across the top and and going at it from that angle. Yeah, um, we've seen a lot of you know underneath under. looks. I like the over the top with him. He's just he's hard to slide to at that point. He's such a big body and he's coming fully downhill, full speed, and he's missing wide. He like it's not like the ball got saved. Nick Kakemo is. Uh, been guarding Dyson on the crease. Um, he's been doing a great job. I think it's tough with a guy like Dyson, right? He's it seems like he's always open, and even if he's covered, you can still throw it in there. So good work by him. It's different seeing Macadori on the backside with the short dodges, a lot harder short dodging a pole, mm -hmm. you know, than than like the speed out of the box. It's 
a good stop there. Let's see, eight seconds left. This is one where you can't have, you can't give up a goal here. All right. Whew, I, feel, I feel like they escaped out of that half. That's my, <laughs> my stress levels are elevated. Big half for Mark. Let's see how many saves he put up on the board. Pretty action-packed first half for only six goals combined. It feels like one of those games that's going to blow open. I think it'll blow open in the third. Yeah. I think the first five minutes are huge in the third. I think I think Duke needs to come out and get one or two. Yeah. And then I think anything can happen. I think if Cuse comes out and scores the first two or three, I think it's going to be one of those that's going to be tough to climb out of. Yeah, definitely. And I think both these teams are great at coming out in the third quarter and making those adjustments at halftime and then really going full throttle. Um, we have we saw Syracuse do it two weekends ago against Hopkins. Um, that might have been last weekend, actually. No, sorry, two weeks ago. Um, and obviously Duke is very capable of it, um, and they've done it numerous times. So, Yeah, and I, and I think also we have to give credit where credit's due. The goalie play on both sides has been great. 69% for Jamison, nine saves, four against, 83% for Mark, 10 saves, two against. So I think shooters on both teams have to continue to uh, keep shooting one. They have to continue to be deceptive, change up shot placement, right? Because they're really going to have their work cut out for them in the second half. Yeah, I think it's a huge point about deceptiveness. Um, it's tough. It, these When these goalies are seeing the ball, um, as an offensive player, you, you do – think about it a little bit more if that goalie is making a bunch of saves. Um, and there are different things that you can do, right? I think one of the best things, and I'm not seeing either team do it a ton, is is really shooting off those screens. And obviously the play has to unfold in the right way for that to happen. Um, but shooting off a screen, so if um, shooting off your defender that's on you or if there's someone through traffic that you can um, just get in the goalie's way um, of seeing that shot. And then – just basic deceptiveness, either going low to high, high to low, um, throwing in, maybe it's a twister, maybe you're doing like a pump, um, just different ways to throw them off their game. I think one of the other ways I heard it explained simply from uh, Michigan coach Scott Bita was deception is also simply doing something different from the last thing that you did, mm -hmm. you know? And so just the simple change it up is something that I think can't go, uh, you know, unsaid. And sometimes like, you know, we, we both know as young coaches too, sometimes players just do the same things over and over, mm -hmm. you know, and I think just having the awareness to mix it up and then execute that is, is critical. And I think there's not a ton that I'm seeing if I'm thinking about the Duke offense going into the second half, besides things that are in their control, it's not scheme right now it's it's just some shot selection you know getting to some better spots on the field continuing to be aggressive all right and you got got to just step up and make plays um you know i think we've talked a little bit about you know maybe coming out maybe some guys initiating from some different spots you know would love to see macadori get longer runs mm -hmm. you know like open him up a little bit um would love to see you know, again, some some better swing side to side so that guys get those short dodges and then attack the middle of the field. Um, and then I think how they set up their picks to get guys advantages below goal line is going to be crucial, too, so that they can create, um, you know, those advantages, come up field, maybe draw slides and look to hit inside or through. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't seem like they, they're not sliding off of a Dyson. Yeah. So they're not going to leave him open. So it's going to be interesting. I think that's where guys have to take those extra steps to get that, you know, better angle and, and put some of those goals away to get the Q's defense rotating. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see if they um, start having someone work with Dyson inside there um, to set some screens. Um, and that could also be Dyson setting some picks inside there, right? Cause they're going to be very hesitant to um, switch off of him. I think speaking for Syracuse and, and, just the way that this game has been going, but also just a the theme with their offense, I think is super important for them to um, not really go through those lapses or those lulls where they're taking the early shot in the possession or 
having a turnover that just really isn't necessary um, because although they're up in this game and it is 4-2, you know that Duke's going to figure it out in one way or another and they're they're going to start making their shots. Um, who knows how many it will be, but I think it's important to be smart and find that balance like we've been speaking about of maintaining that aggressiveness, but also um, working through the shot clock. I'm, I'm not saying to stall it at all because they can't do that. I'm just saying be wary of having those early possessions where they're just empty possessions, right? You're throwing the ball away. You're throwing the ball to the goalie stick um, 10, 12 seconds into the shot clock. Um, definitely don't need that. And I, and I think that's hurt them a little bit um, this season where they've let some teams get back into the game by doing that, whether they have like a five or seven minute stretch. Um, and look, that happens. It does. Um, but just something to keep in mind um, for their offensive players and their offensive leaders, like guys like Hiltz, guys like Spillina, just keeping the offense in check and, and making sure that each possession um, is treated equally and with equal importance. It's interesting too, because the Q's offensive roster seems like it's a mix of some veterans like a Hiltz, but then you've got a lot of young talent that are predominantly sophomores. And then you've got a couple impact transfers. I feel like, you know, and again, like every transfer situation is different, but sometimes it's hard to come in and say, this is how it should be when mm -hmm. you transfer. So maybe those guys are, you know, finding their role of where they can speak up. And then you've got just, again, a, a big core of younger guys. Yeah. And so sometimes like how you work through those discussions, you know, and holding guys accountable to that can be, can be difficult. Yeah. And when you look at their, top call it nine joey spelina is a sophomore finn thompson sophomore michael leo sophomore luke roa sophomore right all top recruits but they've played in big games um so yes they're young generally speaking in terms of that freshman sophomore junior um senior traditional landscape but joey's been the guy um they a lot of these guys have been the guy finn finn was a top five recruit leo i believe was a top five or sorry top 15 recruit um roa somewhere around there um and they played in big games they've played in all the acc games they've played in big 10 games they haven't played in a tournament game yet um but they do have that leadership and i think finding that balance um is important and then respecting those guys like the mule stevens english um which i think they do and then having as i've been saying just with his name hilts um having that one constant i think he can really hold them together um just in terms of the, the direction that they're headed so for those that might be just joining us uh we're at halftime right now cuse is leading duke four to two it's been a big time goalie battle a lot of unsettled play and uh, how these next couple of minutes unfold when the third quarter kicks off are going to be huge. I'm joined by Steven Rafis, 2021 Syracuse alum. I'm Deemer Class. I graduated from Duke in 2016. And we welcome you to the FCL cast. We're excited for the third quarter and uh, appreciate you being on here. If you haven't already, make sure you check out our social media at First Class Lacrosse on Instagram, at First Class Lacs underscore on Twitter and feel free to keep dropping in thoughts questions support in the chat and feel free to share the stream link along as we get gearing up for the second half awesome um one thing that um would love to talk about just some other teams that we're seeing across the country right now um and it could be on the men's or women's side i think leading into the year on the men's side um, everyone was really, really high on the three ACCs being UVA, Notre Dame, and Duke, and everyone still is. Um, been very interesting um, and not surprising at all to see Army doing so well. Um, Army's just been getting better and better each year. They were about a second or two away from making the Final Four last year. Um, they should – I think they'll be favored in every game moving forward. And you said that was the toughest like – one of the toughest games you guys always had was Army. Always. They are – I mean, they legitimately never give up. They get every ground ball. They are extremely disciplined on offense. Um, their defenders, they rarely slide because they rarely need to. Um, so it was always just like a complete dogfight. Um, I think we, I think we were, when I was there, we were two and two against them. Um, just very impressive team, super well coached. Um, 
I think Albarisi and then Justin Ward. I uh, feel like he's been there for a little while now, and he's done nothing but a great job. He was a tremendous, tremendous player um, at Loyola, and I, I think he should get more attention. I think the entire Army program should be getting more attention. Um, they don't have a lot of these ESPNU games, um, but will be interesting to kind of see how their season unfolds if they continue to go undefeated, if they win the Patriot League. Um, I'm not saying it's a cakewalk by any means, but it's definitely a possibility. Um, looking at it, just like the brackets and the way it will go, like is, do you give Army the one seed in the tournament? Um, do you give them a top four seed? Like where do they fall in? And how does that strength of schedule come into play? Just with if you have your ACC winner, which I know they don't get an automatic bid, but then you have your Big Ten winner, your Ivy winner. Um, very important just... To, to keep note of and to see how things unfold. Yeah. I mean, I just want to reiterate the staff at army is, you know, first class. I, I got to spend some time watching practice, uh, two years ago with coach a coach ward, uh, coach Kyle, and, uh, they do an awesome job. I love the way they pr plan practice. They're so thoughtful about the drills that they do and how they put it together. And, constantly reiterating you know until they're you know three o'clock or 3 30 start time every day uh when the guys get out of school and um you know just really cool to see so i'm really happy for the success they're having um you know guys like plunkett more and you know they're very skilled on offense um and they play very together you know mm -hmm. and they play tough and so um you know i'm happy they're getting their recognition and it will be interesting to see know how it comes down to you know strength of schedule rpi all those things i feel like every year there's a different theme that goes on when it comes to bracketology and i'm talking to the expert over <laughs> here this is our in-house bracketologist <laughs> things will really start to heat up this next uh next six weeks um but uh but they're doing great you know uva has continued to be a force you know putting on some big performances same thing with notre dame Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so it's, you know, again, like a lot of teams gearing up to, uh, to, to really make a run, you know, I've liked Yale a lot, you know, they're, they're missing two of their key guys and they're still making a push. Um, and then why don't we, uh, why don't we switch gears here to the women's side and we're, we're calling the game for, for Q's huge win against UNC 20 to five. I think they gave yeah. North Carolina their largest margin of defeat. In program, in program history. history uh so a huge win for coach trainer and you know funny enough um sister yeah shout abby out my sister staff. abby as well um and coach de fleece as well um huge win for them it was alumni weekend um at syracuse on the woman's side and unc has always been one of their toughest opponents um i think unc has probably been more so on the winning side of of that rivalry um, so huge win for them. They've had some tough overtime losses between, um, a great Stony Brook team and very underrated Maryland team who they're ranked number two right now in the country. Um, I really like what I'm seeing from them. I'm very interested to see what they look like going into big 10 and, and when they start playing like the Northwesterns, they've, they've played great teams, but I'm primarily interested in that matchup that if things hold, that'd be a one versus two matchup. Um, so we'll see there. The big 10 on the women's side is stacked this year hopkins has had some big wins michigan um you've got michigan they're 10 and 0 for the first time in program history um those couple games hopkins northwestern etc are on, on the on the docket coming up soon as well as maryland i'll be at that maryland game next week so a uh, lot to look forward to just kicked off third quarter here 4-2 syracuse uh q's first face off win yeah that was huge Great defense there. That's Jack Gray uh, at a Culver Academy and uh, California native. Nice D causing Mule to step in the crease. He he does it all. I've, I think he's great on defense and then very important for Dimity. He's great once he gets the ball, right? He can clear really well. Um, and it just the ball feels reliable when it's in the stick of his. It's just you, you usually know that it's going to get cleared successfully. He's another guy, Steven, top 10 recruit that like when he came in, like, you know, easily probably could have been pushed to offense, you mm -hmm. know, and just it reminds me a lot of Will Halls, who I played with, who again, played a lot of offense and then was just so valuable to the team at the short stick D spot that that's what he ended up, you know, sticking with. And, and who knows if that'll change, uh, but him and McGuire and Jay Caputo have really served, um, you know, to be in, impactful in those spots. Yeah, definitely. 
interesting. It looked like they went kind of big, big back there with uh, O'Neill and Zawada burning two poles. Um, not sure what we'll see moving forward. I would love to see them bring a short stick back there to work with either Zawada or O'Neill um, just to get some movement back there, maybe some switches. Great shot there by Hilt. That's Steven's third assist. Man. They took advantage of that uh, that transition opportunity. And I think that's what you're looking for if you're Syracuse, right? We we talked about coming out strong in the third quarter, get the ball to Hilts on transition. I, I don't know how many goals he's had in his career now where the, the ball is coming down and they find him on that left wing and, and he's going low to high. Um, great job by Stevens there drawing that guy. And, and what a shot. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a beautiful job. You talked about deception at halftime shooting around screens. That was a great job of shooting under the approach, mm -hmm. you know, and changing up the release angle to be able to get it off. And especially when you shoot so underhanded like that, it's truly changing levels. Yeah. And I think really hard to read. And and Hiltz is one of the best at that. Yeah, right. Cause it's not that sidearm release. It is truly underhand. I mean, that that stick is almost at his feet. Another win here. Wow. That's and a huge. goal, Mason Cohn. He has been. I think he has like between six to 10 points right now um, on the year for Syracuse. He is a Tufts transfer or Tufts grad student. Sorry, he graduated from Tufts at Syracuse now. I believe he has another year of eligibility. He was a two sport player. Uh, he played hockey and lacrosse at Tufts. And I do think you kind of can see that it's just in terms of his body movements. He's not afraid to go to goal at all. He's got a couple assists on the season. So huge juice goal there. Yeah, and this is what we talked about at halftime. I think, again, Cuse coming out and scoring two goals quick like this on back-to-back face-off wins. You know, Duke's had their opportunities, and, you know, I think how they dig in and respond here is going to be not just impactful for this game, but it's going to be impactful for, you know, how the second half of their season starts to really pan out. Yeah. So we got Johnny Mullen in here now, switching up the, the Fogos for – Syracuse and they get their third win of the game end of the quarter we got Sam English he takes Waynes a lot Jake Stevens takes Waynes as well Sam's gonna sub off and we'll get that line of Roa Burt Whistle and Jake Stevens in they are let's see some great movement there off that uh, off that original dodge. Yeah, it's good touch passing. Yeah, right. Once they once they draw that that initial guy, they do a good job of getting it to that backside and yeah, um, not and, just that one pass, but maybe two or three passes. Yeah, the, and I I think especially even two, like they'll make three and four, mm -hmm. and then they'll still look inside because they're not taking too long with the ball. Whereas a lot, you know, a lot of people are like, hey, you know, dodge, move it twice, etc. Yeah, definitely. And I think uh, in the past, or at least maybe it was last year, um, at times, Syracuse people would be, and I say people being like Twitter or um, just fans, comment on how they may pass too much at times. Um, and this year, I do think with the addition of Sam English and Jake Stevens, as well as the current guys that they do have, um, I do think they're they're doing a great job of putting that pressure on the defense. Um, so really balancing out having the Dodgers and having the big athletes that you do need in the ACC to compete and win at this level. Um, but then also having the guys to balance that out. I almost thought Zawada probably could have taken that himself. Yeah, I thought he was going to. After he got the defense hung up a bit. I think to Cuse's credit on D, they're, they're disrupting oh. so many passes. Like they're in gloves, you know, and so the way that they're, um, you know, able to kind of get a, you know, stick on a glove, you know, again, unlucky, uh, unlucky run out there for Duke. That was, I feel like maybe the second time I've seen Balsamo out there. I'm sure he's been out there, but would love to see him, love to see Duke get him a little bit more involved. Um, as I was alluding to, I, I think his game is super impressive um, and he can do a lot of things for this Duke offense. And here's the poll on Leo. Look for that pick play with Finn. 
um, they'll go between set in a hard pick there, like you see, and get that switch, or they've done that flyby pick that we've been covering. Yep. Um, they love to do it in that lefty win with, with Leo being that lefty feeder and Finn being that righty picker slash cutter. Good D, good slides there. I like that he got rid of that there. The, the slide came, get rid of it. Here's Gray on Mule. Nice job in the middle of the field. We haven't heard. Good look off the crossbar. Good look there by Sam English. I was going to say we haven't heard Henry Bard's name too much. You know, and there he is coming up with that big ground ball. Another, Another one crossbar. trading crossbars here. O'Neill's still shooting. I like it. No goals in 16 minutes. Wow. I think with the how the momentum swings in these games, it's just you're just telling the team one play at a time. Mm -hmm. You're not going to score four goals in one possession. One play at a time. Continue to chip away. Yeah, and on both sides, right? Obviously, Syracuse up four right now, but six goals is not going to win you this game. And there's a nice low save by Mark. And now we have another Will Mark save it. Maybe yeah, it would. <laughs> I mean, he's the, he's the story of this game right now because yeah. now when you test him low and he makes the save, now that's what gets in the shooter's head. Yeah, you've been shooting high so much. Now he makes the next save low. Where does the next shooter go with the ball? So we'll get that line of uh, Stevens, Roa, Burt, Whistle. They are double pulling it. So with that double pull, they've switched. They started out the game with that pull on um, Burt Whistle, and they've switched it to Roa. You saw Roa had that goal off the Mule assist in the second quarter. Wow, great feed, great finish. Spolina there working that big little matchup behind, um, getting Kenny Brower off of him, getting that matchup on the short stick. And... Not even taking advantage of it from a dodging perspective, but just from his hands free. And Burt Whistle doing a great job off ball there. Cutting back side. He had McGuire, it looks like, on him. What a great finish. And it's just a, for our football guys on here, very similar to a rubber out where mm -hmm. you're just cutting off of someone. You're not necessarily setting a pick. And then two defenders just bumping shoulders inside and that frees up Burt Whistle cutting down to the ball. Yeah. And Burt Whistle does a great job of that. We we were highlighting earlier how he had his first first assist of his career. Um he is in his third year of eligibility. I want to say he's probably around 50 goals on his career. Um great. He's not a Canadian, but he's great off ball. Like he's super savvy, which I say Canadian because you'll usually see a lot of Canadians um like a Dyson Williams, like a Hiltz be really good off ball running off those picks or um off those like beasting picks that we'll talk about sometimes. Burt Wilson has been doing a great job of that. Great catch and shoot guy, but also um, really active and really high IQ deciding when to go um, in time. And I think looking at that play with Spelina on that dodge, Burt Wilson times it up perfectly so that as Spelina is getting to the other side of the cage there, he's cutting to match up right at that perfect right. time. Yeah, especially if you if you cut too early, you know, it's one of those where you get on top of the crease and you don't have anywhere to go. Uh, Coach Donowski always had this phrase at Duke, it's better to be late than early in wait. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that always stuck with me in terms of timing the cuts up. And it's so true. You can always, the guy can continue to carry and then you send the cut versus if you go too early, you're just, he's not going to be able to get you the ball. Yeah, exactly. So hot start for Cuse coming out, 3 nothing, uh out of the you know start to the third quarter. A uh, couple big face-off wins, a couple saves from Mark, and then, you know, obviously Q's converting on that side. So 7-2 seven, seven right now, and, uh, you know, it's going to take a big, big team effort for uh, for the Duke men to turn it around. 8.45 left in the third quarter. Yeah, taking a look right now at the uh, box score on the Syracuse side, we've got Jake Stevens, three assists, Hiltz, which – Really, it was, we'll, we'll say, one and a half assists. I, I think he was making the right looks, but uh, maybe some bounce passes or uh, some, some knockdown. Hiltz with uh, two goals. 
Rowa with a goal, Finn with one goal, Burt Whistle one goal, Leo one goal, Cohen one goal, right? It's really, it's spread out between those top nine guys offensively. And then you get that goal from Cone. I always say like one goal going the way of a Fogo, if you can win it, win it off the, off the face off, that can erase maybe three or four um, face off losses throughout the game. Um, so, so great job there. And then Spolina, who we're seeing on screen here now, um, has honestly, I, th I think he's been playing a really good game. People will definitely be in the comments after saying how he doesn't have 10 points and he shouldn't be wearing 22 or he's not that good, but he's playing his role. Um, look, they're, they're up five. I think their offense has looked really good from, uh, not only just scoring wise, but just the way that it's flowing. Um, and I think he's been doing a really good job of playing within that flow and not disrupting it. Um, and then capitalizing when he needs to, like he just did on that last play on that assist to uh, Jackson bird whistle. Yeah. And I, I've always loved um, what I've always loved about Spolina's game too, is that he moves well without the ball, you know, so he doesn't have to be uh, ball dominant. And I, I also think like, from a one-on-one -on -one perspective, Brower might have the advantage a little bit here, you know, so how they continue to utilize the pick game, but also, you know, give other guys opportunities to push and create, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's what is important to do is just, you know, play your role and that can change from game to game. He's going to get points, but also seven to 10 points a game is just not realistic for everyone, you know? Yeah, exactly. So this is one of those possessions here that I was alluding to at half. Just want to make sure I know it's shot clock winding down here and it's going to go Duke ways, but a little bit sloppy. Just want to make sure that that was kind of the only possession that they're going to be sloppy on. And if you're the Syracuse offense and if you're March, just making sure these guys are regrouped when they get back out there, um, get a good look, get a good possession. Don't force things inside that aren't there. Um, the offense that you've been running is working for you. So just continue to, to use it. And, you know, not to mention they use the entire shot clock. Mm -hmm. So to use all 80 seconds, give your defense a rest, kill some time off the clock. You're already over halfway through the third quarter. Yeah. You know, and so it just starts to minimize some of the window that Duke can get stuff going on the offensive side. Haven't seen McAdory out here much in this third quarter, unless I've been missing him. Uh, but was looking for them to get him coming out of the box there. We get O'Neal on this high wing. I think that's Caden Cole on him now. So they do have a do have a switch from uh Billy John's been guarding him who's a lefty. Join two. Good spot. Only four seconds left in the shot clock. Yeah, do you kill this or do you go for it? You probably try to look inside and then you kill yeah, it. Yeah, kill it. Good defense there by Syracuse again. Oh, has clearly got a great game plan. You know, like they're yeah. they look confident. You know, they're they're doing well in their one on one matchups. You know, they're really making them work here. You know, I, I'm curious about McAdory as well. You know, you see in there at the top of the box. Yeah, no, Dierna, he has played Duke before at Manhattan. I believe it was maybe yep. in 2022. Um, could have been last year as well, but I know that Manhattan has matched up against Duke. So it's not Odierna's first time seeing the offense, and now he's using them with a different team. Here's Carpenter. If he can get it off the ground. Yeah, and that was one of those possessions there where I don't think Spelina needed to force it inside. I think Burt Whistle Stick did get knocked down off ball a little bit. Yep. Um, just down to the ground, but could probably work for for a better one there. Um, and like I said, just need to protect. Not not protect your lead, but just protect the way you're playing, right? You don't need to don't need to force certain things. Yeah, I think this is. I mean, this is where Duke needs to come, keep firing and play loose, and this is where Qs can't get tight. Yeah, you know? exactly. That's, Find that balance. That is that that fine balance. I'm guessing Macadori should be coming in. Yeah, there he is. I would like to see them have have waited for McAdory to get in there and play six on six instead of playing that five on six. Yeah, we've got 50 seconds left in the shot clock. It's a really good, good double, double. 
I think Syracuse has been doing a good job of that defensively. Um, they've been timing their doubles really well. They've been sliding to the rollbacks a lot. Yep. Well, you saw on the one earlier in this quarter that Mark intercepted. They sent the double to O'Neill at the island, and yep. then it just disrupted the pass enough to. They should get this ball back to, to throw the pass off. I'm surprised O'Neill gave that up. He had, I believe, Wyatt Hoddle matched up on him, a, a freshman short stick, um, which is a big size size matchup there for O'Neill. Yeah, Hoddle's a really scrappy athlete out of Calvert Hall. Yeah. He had a really good career for the Hall class of 2023. I think was originally committed to Richmond and just had a big senior year at, at the Hall. Yeah, and he was playing some offense early. They they had some injuries on at the D mid possession or position, um, and I just heard through the grapevines just throughout the season that uh, Wyatt is is very good defender and like you're saying, super scrappy. So they've been playing him more at D mid um, recently, and and he's been doing a great job. I think when you look at his stature, I think he's maybe five seven, um, but been playing really really well. Got a flag down here. So we'll see this Syracuse man up again. We'll see if they run an overload, which has been just a, a traditional Syracuse man up for years. Um, overloading the one side, so they'll have three guys between GLE and, and the top. They'll, they'll go three guys on the side with one in the middle, two on the back side, um, and they can kind of switch fields back and forth between the left and right. Um, so we'll get a good look here. I always remember uh, in the in the games that we played, I felt like it was the classic wheel mm -hmm. that uh, Coach Donahue would put in with Dylan Stats. Yeah, so they Kevin just, Rice. They disguise it a little bit there. Bert Whistle with another one. Great pass in there from Finn. And you see how well they move the ball that it touches every point. You know, skip, top, look inside, catch and release. Yeah. And they just play out of the 3-3, three, three, you know, so well. And then, like you said, like sometimes that overload. Yeah, and I couldn't tell. They they didn't start in the overload, but it looked like they were going to be in it for a minute. But then Finn moved into that center position, um, and Burt Whistle just stayed high there. So um, good disguise on their end and great shot Bert whistle there changing um changing planes right he went low to high we've seen a couple a couple there now um between himself and hilts i think finn earlier as well duke ball that might have been one of nasa's first ones of the uh of the second half here yeah i think you're right O'Neal just misses wide there. Not a bad take. You see him changing it up. Yeah. And like we said earlier, we like when he comes across, goes to his left, sweeps across the top. Really hard to defend. figueroa has been doing a great job on Zawada back there. Yeah, he's he's really been been pestering him. You know, and I think again, like they just haven't they haven't needed to slide too much except when they've wanted to to push you know to cause tempo yeah i think the only place i haven't seen them really test mark now is near side low you know we've seen him he's got a wide stance we've seen them you know pull a few low and away right and now he's obviously taken up net so he, and you can really see like you don't see a lot of the a lot of the net and then beautiful goal there by Zawada. Yeah, I think we got a little uh, head dip there. A little leaner and a little Stephen yeah. Rafe's action. <laughs> the nice play. Duke went. They brought two short six behind, and they were working that matchup. Um, so putting those four poles inside and, and some good off-ball movement. You see Balsamo there maybe looking for a seal. Um, great finish there. There's your stick to the middle. Yeah. That's the, the way to do it, right? The righty bringing it back to the left. Nice vision by Denenza. 
There's some life here for yeah. the Dukies. Oh, there's there's a ton of time left in this game. It is far from over. We got a crew out at Schaefer's, I believe, in uh in New York, more of the Chelsea area. That's the uh, usual that's, usual spot for you guys Duke, to watch that's these the games. Duke watering right? hole. Somehow you convinced me to. Come hang out with you for the game. <laughs> <laughs> Got to switch fields here on this clear. Don't want to go up the box side. Just three, gets, three seconds left. Gets busy up there. Nice clear. Good patience there by those poles. It, it becomes so important for those poles to have good stick skills on the clear. It's because they do end up getting the ball so much and are required to make... Those tough plays, not only the tough feeds, but also competing against the clock, right, with 20 seconds to get it over. And you see him really being methodical here, killing this clock. Work this two-man back here. That's great there. Great offense, great feed there by Spolina. I like that they're still... I like Finn took some time off of that shot clock, off the game clock, bringing it behind. Um, they saw a matchup they liked in, in terms of just having Finn with the short stick back there and Joey Spolina with Kenny Brower on him using that big little, which we've seen them go back to. Um, and they've had success getting open inside there. And that's a great, great look by Spolina and, and a great finish by Millet. Um, He's pretty crafty inside. He's had some, some highlight reel goals, some behind the backs, some just really high IQ plays, but also just – high skill plays with the stick. Yeah, we were talking about transfers. I mean, Mule has done a great job of coming in, you know, from Lehigh, had a great career there. Um, again, another Team 91 guy. Yep. You know, playing with uh back playing with Spelina. So he's he's fit right in and uh he's done a great job this year. Um I think if you're, you know, Duke defensively, you're just a little frustrated that guys aren't necessarily creating advantages off dodges. And, you know, guys are still getting open inside. So, you know, again, to to make any kind of run here in the fourth quarter, they're going to have to tighten those up because, you know, Brower did a good job of navigating the pick, right? And and he's splitting it two times now. Has not necessarily gotten open for his own, but he's such a great feeder that, you know, guys get a little space off ball. And... Yeah, and that's something I think I'd like to see Duke take advantage of more on offense. I feel like they're really looking to beat their guy cleanly and get, some really good looks off the dodge. I think that last possession, um, you saw them invert and then find Zawada on the backside. He wasn't necessarily wide open, um, but was a really good feed to then him just making a good play on the backside. I think they could make some more of those um, to get back in it. Yeah, Ooh, you see nice another one on that. I don't know where the flag was. I must have missed something. So we'll see this Syracuse man up again. I don't have we seen a Duke man up yet? No, I don't think so. Technical interference. So you see, Syracuse will hold this ball. There's only three seconds left. They'll hold the ball, keep it so that they start the fourth quarter on man up. I'm sure they would uh, off ball. Carpenter on Hiltz there. Yeah, kind of. Got him high, I guess. I don't know. Maybe it was just trying to cut off his yeah his flash down. Would we'll look to Syracuse. It'll be interesting to see if they um, have like an opener type on this man up um, to kind of capitalize off, off of it right away to get that momentum in the fourth, um, or if they just stick to their to their basics. I don't know if March will want to show play or or whatnot. Yeah, I mean, you make a good point, especially just with late season. You know, now again, you're up by six goals. You know, they've shown such a good job of just being able to operate out of their base extra man set. Yeah. You know, do you put that on film like you talked about and give someone something to scout? Or, you know, do you just, you know, run out the 27 seconds and try to, you know, score a regular man up goal? I wouldn't mind seeing like a flip, fake flip action to yeah. then look at inside into the pipes. Yeah. You know, simple. Uh, that's not something for me that I would care if someone saw that. Yeah, they exactly. Still have to cover it. They still have to cover it exactly. All right, so we have we are heading into the fourth quarter. 
Duke, Syracuse. Syracuse is up 9-3. Just taking a look at um, some some stats across the board. Steven still with three assists. Finn Thompson, 1-1. One one. Spolina, 0-2. Oh he had two nice assists that quarter. One, one lefty feed, one righty feed, working that big little behind. Burt Whistle with two goals, one nice cut, and one on the man up. Uh, Mule, 1-1. One one. He's been very steady, very good. Hiltz, 2-0. Roa, Leo, and Cone, each with a goal. Um, on Duke's side, we have McAdore with one, Zawada with one, um, and Johnson with one. We had, I believe, one goal from Duke that quarter, correct? That's a lot of goal. Yeah, just one. And then face-offs, Syracuse won six face-offs um, that quarter, and Duke, I believe, won one. Um, and then if we look at goalies, we'll mark at 79%. Very impressive. And Jameson, he's at 55%. He's been great. Um, he's faced a lot. and He's faced a lot inside, too. Yeah. You know, they've, they've really been, you know, pounded him inside. So I think he's saved a ton of the ones he should have, and he's stolen a few inside as well. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think Mark will make the headlines right now at this point in the game, but I think you you do have to give a lot of credit to Jamison and, and the job that he's done. 55% is definitely good. Interesting I, stat here. Yeah, I like that graphic. Surprise in that Maryland game that the, that there was such a drought. And interesting to note at the bottom, all four are, are home games. Syracuse has definitely loaded the schedule up with uh loves the dome. With home games. Hey, I mean people are traveling to it. What did we say Duke was going to this game? One and five in the dome? One and five on the road at Cuse and one and four in the dome. I guess it was your game winner was the one that was outdoors game tire game tire yeah curry had the uh game winner in that's overtime right. that's right that was a wild game all right so we'll see this man up doesn't look like they're running anything crazy i think just getting into their set in a different way i Hilt's thought that one in yeah honestly. hilts pulls that <laughs> near side you saw a little movement in that top yeah, corner yeah. <laughs> I think officials are trying to figure out if that's a reset or not. It shouldn't be with the way that it looked like it went. Yeah, it looked like it hit the back of the net. Or that Jameson hit his stick into, into the goal. Five seconds left on this man up. Yeah, so too low. Yeah, and then here, here there might be some different matchups, right? They're throwing that guy in. I think you got Jake Stevens with a short stick on him. I think they'll look to go from him here. Nice move. Low time here. It's good rotation there by Duke. Good shot. Ooh. I like wow. that by Hiltz. Right, throws it low, so even if the goalie does make a save, he's not catching it up high and then outlining it. And it's it not a it's not a clean one always. Yeah, you know, it was like a semi rebound. It's yeah. kind of like uh, I remember good friend Ryan Brown. He would talk about you know shooting like a curving bounce shot outside the two point arc, you know, and just gets on net and hard to catch clean. Looked like a clearing uh clearing offsides there. And that's a killer, right? You just kill off that man up, kill off the rest of the um, possession, the rest of the shot clock, and then I'm guessing it was an offsides or something. Gives Syracuse the ball right back. Yeah, we just saw the turnover margin. I mean, 15 turnovers for Duke is just not going to, you know, be able to, you know, overcome. You know, you have, you're have you minus nine in the turnover category and you're down by six goals. Mm-hmm. Wow, great Unreal feed. Look. Great catch and finish there. Is that Hiltz? Yeah. That's another one where Leo doesn't exactly beat his guy. Hiltz isn't wide open, but they just their timing has been great tonight. I guess Leo did have a nice step on him. 
Yeah, it also that one just feels different to me though, where he's getting he's getting the middle of the field. Yeah, so you have to go. And and he's just more of a threat and he's top down versus like the ones we saw with Spelina kind of angling out towards the sideline, not really putting pressure. Yeah. And he's not really in shooting spots. Like those guys weren't hedging. Yeah. You know, there you see like one or two guys are hedging. That is really nice vision from Leo. Yeah. And I think a lot of the times people will be hesitant to throw that top down pass where the guy that's catching it then has to turn and face the goal. Um, it can just be a little bit difficult to finish. And also the defense can be sliding up. But a guy like Owen Hiltz, he's shown that he can handle that um, that type of pass throughout his entire career. So we got 13, 12 and a half, 13 minutes left. Fourth quarter, 10-3 Syracuse. Looks like Duke is going to look to invert a little bit here. Invert or, or two-man probably with Zawada back there. Yeah, just they they had Dyson there and just, you know. I don't know if that was Dyson or that was uh maybe Sloat or another MIDI. Caused turnover there by uh Carpenter. I believe he's closing in on what I think is a Duke record. I think JT Giles Harris has it. Nice knockdown there. Yeah, I mean, you have to give the QC a lot of credit. Like, I, I think they look sharp. I think they've really been disruptive, and you know, they've just caused a lot of uh, caused a lot of miscues in just subtle ways. I think like there's just not a, as many clean passes as you would have liked, you know, offensively from Duke. Someone's open. Yeah, and I think speaking of Figueres, I think he. Um, has been doing a good job of just staying on Zawada's hands, right? Zawada's such a threat as a feeder, and he's just kind of been disruptive. I couldn't tell if Mark saved that there, if that was wide ball by uh, Balsamo. I believe it was a reset, so it must have been a save. second there i didn't know if they had backup on that uh denenza take oh dear not across the midfield line yelling about something <laughs> <laughs> have you ever seen any uh any hop into zone latent possessions out of this year's uh qc i think they may have done it once or twice there's a neil righty take it's a nice shot. There's a stick side low. Yeah. You're calling it. Not near side in this situation, but it again, it's one of the one of the spots that we haven't really seen tested as much. Mm -hmm. And I think it's been harder for O'Neill specifically as a lefty. Um, as a lefty shooter, it can be hard to get the ball down to that location. Yeah. Um Usually, like your better shooters are able to do it, and obviously he's capable of it. Um, but you saw him go righty there and put it in that that corner we've been talking about, or, or that Deemer's been talking about. Yeah, this is a big one here for Naso. Yeah, this game is still far from over, in my opinion. As a uh... As a Duke alum, I want you to feel really confident. <laughs> <laughs> that would never end well. 10 minutes is a long time. It reminds me of that, that 2019 game we were playing Duke um, at CNS, the, the outdoor field. They were doing work in the dome or there was an event or something, and Duke was up like 8-2 or something on us in the fourth. Like We could not generate any sort of offense, and I think we scored yeah. five late. Just chipping away. Another good, another good slide. Yeah, I was trying to think about 
my senior year, how many goals we were down. And that was our Jimmy Regan day. You know, um, you know, Jimmy Regan uh, played at Duke, um, you know, died serving our country and uh, wore the number 10. And we honored him every year with a game. And um, that happened to be Cuse my senior year. And I just remember, you know, similar, like kind of just came out down by five, six, seven goals. And then we ended up uh, going on a run late. Do you remember how many goals you had? Yeah, seven. <laughs> <laughs> Probably best game of my career. I think you had a uh, a notable celebration in that game as well. Yeah, that's uh, a lot of my buddies joke about that one. The, the start the fire <laughs> classic celebration there. I didn't hate it. I kind of liked it. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say kind of looking back, feels like one of the worst celebrations of all time. We might have to break <laughs> that one down at some point. <laughs> I think people that know you were probably ripping on you for it, but I think I personally at the time did not know you. I thought it was planned, and I was like, I mean, I, I think he just had like his fifth or sixth or seventh goal. I think he can do whatever you want. I think I just remember seeing Matt Lane and Mariano or someone like at the Jersey Shore, and you know, some chirps started flying. So, and I was probably already self conscious. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Lane loved it. Lane was probably trying to reenact it. He probably wasn't even chirping. Yeah. Speaking of Lane, he's trying to, uh, he's been trying to get on the cast tonight. Hopefully this is the first, not the last. And we can, uh, get some guests on in the future. Yeah. Make it happen someday. Score it. Big save. Huge save by Mark. I like that move a lot by Zawada. We got 10, four Q's. For anyone that's listening but is not able to watch the stream, 10 4 Qs, just under eight minutes left in the game. Huge doorstep save by Colin Mark. He's really been standing on his head today. He's had an incredible performance, and uh, as well as the Qs D, and uh, that's really given the offense a lot of opportunities, and they've been cashing in. So, a uh, six goal lead as uh, you know the time starts to tick for the Blue, the blue Devils. So, Finn has been, he's, he did this on uh, in the third quarter as well. Caught the ball coming out of the box. Has that short stick on him. Kind of that slow trot back to X. Take some time off the clock. Work that two-man back there. Reset. Joey should hold this for a little bit longer. We got the reset. Got the full shot clock. No need to force anything. Another reset. He wanted that one. He did. You saw five guys with their <laughs> arms up. And he he wasn't listening. Took that lefty too. Mule will work this this matchup and, and this clock here, I think. It's a fifth year Charlie O'Connor. Out of Paul the sixth, I believe. Mule's high IQ for sure. Ooh. Brother Cam graduated from Duke a couple of years ago. And work this two man again with with Finn and Joey. Get that switch. Good possession here by Syracuse just off that off that reset, working it behind, getting matchup changes, going back to what's been working for them. You know, I, I again like I haven't hated that matchup for them. It's just about not getting beat off the ball. Yeah. It's just, and that's what I mean when I'm saying matchup, like bring that big little behind, do that work inside. Um, yeah. At least get Joey's hands free to feed or, or Finn's hands free to feed um, and find those cutters that have been having success inside there, whether it's been with Hiltz or Burt Whistle. I think Duke's got to. They've got to go. Gotta start to push. Yeah. I think. I got a flag there. I'd throw this ball out of bounds. Just get right to that man up. All right, 515 left. You got to score here. Yeah, this is, I think, the first time we'll see Duke EMO. Um, 
believe they've been pretty good this season. Um, It'll be uh, interesting what they go up. for here. They've they've typically had a pretty nice like two four look where they end up creating like a step down for O'Neal on that they, opposite they side. Feel yeah. and they take it on the opposite side. You know, I don't love that here. Um, but again, it'll be, and I'm sure that again, Cuse has that scouted. Um, but we'll just see what they try to go to, to, to manufacture a look. Yeah. 37% on the season on extra man for Duke here. And there it is. Just, you know, not a ton of angle. Yeah. But you know, the, the design was there. Good read by Syracuse. I feel like they got out to that pretty fast, made uh, O'Neal hitch. Yeah, and Balsamo is doing a good job waiting for that outside defender to to rotate. Mm -hmm. Duke's had a couple just stick work errors, whether it's just a pass, a low pass, or I think that is credited to Syracuse gaining their hands sometimes, but it looks like some unforced just. Um, that pass, maybe it's that dome air, <laughs> a little bit different <laughs> a little in there. Humid. The air is, I will say, the stick can throw different sometimes. Yeah, but you can, you can adjust to it. Yeah, I mean, you know, again, there's been unforced, there's been forced, um, there's just been, you know, just too many, you know, passes not on the stick to uh, to have success. So, yeah. um, you know, I think this is a game that. They had their chances early and, you know, Q's really grinded down as they started winning more face-offs, you know, to their credit, they started converting more. So, um, you know, that combined with the Mark goalie play has been the story of the game. Yeah, for sure. I think holding this, this Duke team right now to four goals with under four left to play in the fourth quarter. I don't think that's what anyone saw coming in. Not, not necessarily, due to Syracuse's defense, just because of the high power that, that Duke has. We were talking earlier, um, I was talking with some of my Syracuse friends, and we were saying if you can hold O'Neal and Zawada to, say, combined under 10 points or 8 points, that we thought Syracuse would have a good chance of, of winning this game. Um, and But obviously, it, it's been a, a bit of a different story here. Yeah, I think both of us were hoping for one goal thriller. Yeah, definitely. Low shot clock there. So what do you think this game is going to mean for strength of schedule, RPI? Yeah, I think... And ACC overall. Yeah, there's obviously still... A ton of lacrosse to play. I think going into this game, this was for Syracuse at least just kind of a you basically you win this and you you put yourself in a really good position to get an at large um, looking at the tournament. Um, Duke only with one loss on the season, but I think there are obviously the knowns between UVA and Notre Dame and Duke, and I think Syracuse has been on the outside of there. Um, I think people have had them ahead of UNC, so they've been in that four spot with the with the ACC, and it's unclear whether the ACC is going to be able to get four teams in or not. I think everyone's thinking that three is definitely um, reasonable and, and will probably happen right now, and I think a lot of people have been saying and the records have been showing that that would be the UVA, Duke, and Notre Dame. Um, this is a huge win for Syracuse for a host of reasons, I think, speaking. Well, they haven't won yet, but two minutes left. Um, just speaking about getting into that upper echelon of of teams in the country, teams in the ACC, um, I think this is a huge win for the resume. Um, it was talked about, like, if they could sneak a win between – if they could take care of, of business outside of the ACC. I know they have a big matchup with Cornell, which is an out-of-conference um, game, so that's going to be one to circle just with that Ivy versus ACC. And then um, if they could take care of Carolina and then grab a win versus Duke, Notre Dame, or UVA – um, everyone thought that that would give them a really good chance. So they, they've grabbed one here, um, in March. So definitely big. I, I think Duke is, is just fine. Um, but we'll see. 
Yeah, they're going to be tested again uh, on the road. Neutral site game against Denver on Sunday. They'll play a tough BU squad on the 27th. And then they'll get a little more extended break for Sunday, April 7th at home versus Notre Dame. Um, they've got back-to-back -back home games, Notre Dame and Virginia, and then at Chapel Hill to finish out their uh, regular season slate. A lot of games left to play. Um, on the other side of that, Syracuse Rise, they will be at Hobart this weekend, which is always a sneaky upstate big rivalry um, at Notre Dame. Syracuse hasn't won at Notre Dame in a long time, I think since 2017. Notre Dame's really been winning that matchup against Syracuse for the last couple of years, especially since since Pat Cavanaugh has gotten there. Um, and they've been some pretty lopsided wins. Um, at Cornell, which we were speaking about, um, that's a tough one, just usually a Tuesday game, an away game. Um, playing in the cold, I, th I think it is notable that Syracuse's next four games are going to be away. Um, so that's going to be important to watch and just how weather may impact things. Um, and then they'll finish at home against Virginia. Well, huge win for Cuse, 10-4 over Duke. Um, you know, again, huge hats off to Will Mark, especially in that in the Cuse defense. Had a great game plan, executed. Uh, did a great job on the Duke shooters and, uh, you know, huge top five win. Uh, only the second under Gary Gate. Uh, both have come in the last two weeks. And, uh, you know, hats off. Proud Cuse alum over here. <laughs> um, Duke needs to bounce back. Uh, but uh, Steve, awesome, you know, doing this game cast with you. Really appreciate everyone that tuned in. Yeah, thank you guys. That was a blast, obviously. Um, happy to see Syracuse come up with a win. Um, great job from them. I think top to bottom between obviously Will Mark, I think faceoffs, they made a great adjustment, um, defensively. I think that's the best game I've seen Syracuse defense play in, in, in some years now. Um, and offensively, they just, they're continuing to be, um, one of the top off offenses in the country, but overall great hopping on here with you. Um, great to talk shop. I feel like we do this in, in general. <laughs> I know. Um, I'm glad this time. is routine now for us. Yeah. Uh, Steve started with us in February and, uh, Really excited to have him out to our summer camps and best in class this summer. Already got you going with some trainings, uh, you know, working with our athletes and, uh, you know, building our online community. So um, if you haven't checked it out before, make sure you check us out on social media, Instagram at first class lacrosse and Twitter at first class lacks underscore. Uh, we have a free Friday newsletter that goes out every Friday. Make sure you subscribe. You can check us out at first one st classlax.com and stay tuned for any camps and trainings. Uh, we just finished up a lot of our winter slate. So we'll be focused on making a lot of content uh, these next couple uh, weeks to finish out through Memorial Day. And then we'll switch gears to summer camps and events. But uh, hopefully we'll get to, to do this on again and get Coach Dunn involved for our, our next game cast. But appreciate everyone tuning in and uh, thanks so much. Hope you have a great rest of the week. Thank you. See you guys.